So, hello everyone. Uh, today, uh, th thank you everyone who joined us in this Immun webinar. Today, we are glad to have uh, Professor Jean Pierre Chatzaman Peron talking about immunometabolic immun immun impact of SARS CoV 2 on the central nervous system. Uh, Dr. Jean is graduating in biology with emphasis on bio biology applied to health from Universidade Federal de Londrina. He received his PhD from the University of Sao Paulo. And dur during uh, his, the doctorate, he spent a year in Howard Weiner Laboratory at Harvard Medical School, Center of Neurological Disease. He did his postdoctorate at the University of Sao Paulo, and currently, uh, Dr. Jia is professor at our Department of Immunology. Actually, actually uh, his research group is studying the interactions between central nervous system resident cells and the infiltrating mononuclear cells during neural inflammatory process. So thank you so much, Professor Jia, for accepting our invitation. Then after your talk, we are open for questions. Thank you so much. Perfect, no, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's definitely a, a pleasure and an honor to share with you a little bit of what we've been doing during these last two years of pandemics. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen here, you, which you have to allow me, Paula, because it's not allowed for me right now. Okay, now it is. Uh, there you go. Could you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right, awesome. So uh, what, I'm going show, uh, what I'm going to show to you today is, uh, is data that we gather in this project we started almost at the beginning of the pandemic, of course. So my lab is pretty much interested in the interaction between the immune system and the central nervous system. And we work with viral infection in the brain is something that we are interested in. So, and we, we want to understand the impact of either the virus itself or the environmental uh, uh, inflammation that it causes in the brain. So. We want to understand what's going on in this aspect. And of course, we are interested in the different, in, in, both infiltrating immune cells, but in this case here, we are more interested in CNS resident cells. So what I'm going to show to you is the impact that SARS-CoV-2 does on astrocytes and, during, and, and on the overall function of this cell in the brain. And we have both uh, uh, data that was, uh, that we got, uh, from in vitro experiments. And later on, I'm gonna to show to you what we have using the in vivo model in Syrian, uh, in Syrian hamsters. So of course, what I have to mention is that this project was performed, uh, most of it was performed at our lab in the scientific platform Pasteur USP in, uh, where we have a PSL3 facility and also some of the experiments were performed here at uh, Isabe with the collaboration with uh, some colleagues, which I'm going to acknowledge at the end of my talk. So, of course, I'm not going to go through this a lot because everybody knows. Pre if you are if you are tuned in the information and Twitter and you know all this media, of course you know a lot about SARS-CoV-2. Of course, we are going through this terrible pandemic of COVID-19. So, but I just want to mention a few a few things that I believe it is important. So coronaviruses, they belong to a, you know, a family of important viruses that can infect human subject. And three of them are more, uh, they are capable of causing a more severe disease, of course, which is SARS-CoV-1, MERS, and now SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's an enveloped virus in which the spike protein is probably the most important one because that's the protein responsible for interacting with host cells and mediating uh, further invasion. Uh, the genome of the coronavirus is around 30,000 base pairs, right? It's like uh, three times bigger than Zika virus, for example. 
and it codes for many different proteins that include uh, uh, both uh, 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 structural proteins and non-structural proteins, right? So what is important for us here is to know that this virus is capable of infecting cells that express the receptor for the spike, which is ACE2. And, but not only that, but also the expression of the protease called TMPRSS2, which is important for the cleavage of the spike protein and further uh, uh, invasion of the cell. Recently, it has also been shown that another receptor called neuropilin-1 is also capable of mediating the infection or the invasion of the virus to the cell. So neuropilin is uh, broadly uh, uh, expressed in the brain, for example. And I know we do not have addressed the role of neuropilin-1, I know that some colleagues from Unicamp, for example, they are doing that. But I want to call your attention is that the virus has the possible has the the, the tools uh, to invade uh, central nervous system cells. So that's one that's something that I want to point out during my during my talk. Okay, so when we go back to the COVID nineteen pandemic, it's so we all know that it started late this uh, uh, late two thousand and nineteen, and then of course around. I think it was around May or April, we had the first cases in, in Brazil, right? Well, we know this uh, pulmonary disease and the patients may, some of them develop severe disease, uh, dying by a cytokine star associated pathogenesis. But what I want to point out here is that since the beginning, like since March and April, two uh, one big paper has already demonstrated that SARS-CoV-2 was able to impact the brain. So, of course, the first feature, the first problem that had been shown was, for example, the stroke. And of course, we knew that had further it was described the correlation with coagulation, for example. But also many other papers had shown that along with the stroke that was further, you know, a, a, solve it with the, uh, with the anticoagulant, for example, treatment. Uh, we had some cases of encephalopathies, we had cases of headache. So this neurological uh, uh, range of symptoms was very broad. So we had patients with, uh, for example, headache or confusion to patients that develop stroke and encephalopathies. So from the very beginning, we could, or we, we, you know, the disease had shown that there are there is something going on, considering uh, the central the central nervous system, and of course, most recently, not only these acute cases of, of neurological dysfunction, but now in we 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 have what is called as brain fog or long COVID in which we see that patients, even patients that had not developed severe disease, but a more mild disease, they still develop features like, uh, they have symptoms like uh, cognitive impact, they have memory loss, they have confusion. And this type of symptoms, they, they, you know, they last for longer than it was supposed to, to do. So the question is, is there, what, what is going on concerning SARS-CoV-2 and this more cognitive and memory of functional aspect of the brain? So that was something that we were interested in at the very beginning, right? So, and from March and April, 2020, many, many other papers were published showing that broad range of symptoms and signs that people with COVID-19 may develop in, in relation uh, uh, to, to the neurological aspect of, of the disease. So because of that, we started working in a model in vitro using primary cells, brain primary cells of Syrian hamsters. So probably you know that although mice, white type mice are not susceptible to the infection uh, with SARS-CoV-2, on the other hand, uh, the Syrian hamster is very susceptible. So that's the reason why we started working with that. So the first thing we did was let's check whether cells of the brain are able to be infected. And of course, we were primarily interested in astrocytes. And the reason for that is because, well, astrocytes are very abundant. Astrocytes, they are very important for the metabolic uh, function of the neurons. So 
Astrocytes, they, of course, they are capable of mounting an immune response, but they are very important you know, in, in capturing and metabolizing uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. So of course, we had many questions, both under the aspect of immune response and also of the metabolism uh, concerning the infection. So what we did was we extracted the brain of these animals. We, we extracted them from the meninges, of course, because the meninges have many uh, immune cells, resident immune cells. So we processed the brain in vitro. Until the end, we had a primary culture of astrocytes. And then after we established that culture, we infected the cells with SARS-CoV-2 under different MOIs. And then we started to check our uh, to do our experiments. So the first thing I can show to you here is our purity was around 85%. So here in, in green, these are GFAP positive astrocytes. And of course, we had some contaminations with MAP2 and EBA1. Well, of course, MAP2 are neurons and EBA1 are uh, microglial cells, but we consider that very reduced amount of cells. So you can see here, that astrocytes are infected with SARS-CoV-2. So here in red, we can see spike staining inside a GFAP positive cell. And again, if you, and this was confirmed here by uh, genome quantification after 72 and 96 hours. So this is a uh, viral genome, and this is viral particles that are released in the supernatants. So from this data here, we can see that the SARS-CoV-2 is able to invade the cell, infect the cell and replicate. So in order to uh, have more, uh, a better idea of what's going on, we also perform an electron microscopy. And as you can see here on the left, we can see the viral particles attached to the cell membrane. But what is also interesting is that if you look to the right, so these blebs like structures here like bubbles like they are called double membrane vesicles and these has been shown previously to be very characteristic of coronavirus infection in a cell so so far we can say that yes so our astrocytes they are infecting and they are supporting the replication of of SARS-CoV-2 well as i mentioned before of course Astrocytes, they are able, they are fully able to mount uh, an innate immune response. They have all the machinery to activate, for example, tall like receptors or not like receptors and so on. So we wanted to check whether the presence of the virus in these cells, uh, it is inducing an inflammatory response. And the answer is yes. So if you check here, we could see that there was an increase of inflammatory cytokines as IL-6, IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, and of course, of type one interference, mostly here as interferon uh, alpha. And well, what could prove that the interferon is being in fact secreted, uh, to prove that interferon alpha is being in fact secreted, we also checked for ISGs as ISG20 and IFTM3 and we see an upregulation. So this is telling us that, uh, you know, type one interferons are being secreted in the culture, although we are doing everything in, in PCR, of course. And also ACE2 expression was increasing. And I like to mention that ACE2 is also responsive to type one interference. So here we see that besides infecting and replicating the cell, SARS-CoV-2 is yes, inducing an uh, immunological and immune response. So the next thing was, well, we wanted to have a, a better picture of what's going on, especially metabolically. And for that, uh, we started a collab collaboration with Professor Daniel Martins de Souza from Unicamp, and of course, his lab, uh, neuroproteomics lab. And we started to check what were the overall changes in protein expression in those brains. So we did pretty much the same thing. We extracted the brain, we isolated the primary astrocytes, we infected the cells, and then we performed a proteomic analysis of those cells uh, uh, after many days of cultures. And what we saw was very interesting. So at first, we, we clearly can see that there are many differently expressed proteins when we compare the control versus SARS-CoV infected. But was, what was most important or, or more 
interesting to us was that many of these proteins, they related to uh, metabolic proteins. For example, I only point to one protein here that was upregulated, which is the glutamine fructose cisphosphate transaminase, for example. This is only one of many proteins that we observed to be altered in, uh, in astrocytes that were infected with SARS-CoV-2. So this was the first better uh, uh, data uh, or more you know, wide, if I can say, range of data that tell us that yes, there is a uh, change in the expression of proteins, especially those that are related to the metabolism of the cell. So, and next, what was interesting is that when we did an enrichment uh, pathway analysis, we, we saw that many of the pathways that were enriched were those related to carbon metabolism, for example, uh, biosynthesis of amino acids, TCA cyclo-glycolysis, right? So this shows that, yes, most of the proteins that were changed during SARS-CoV-2 infection, they belong to pathways or they belong to uh, 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 biological processes correlated with energy and uh, carbon metabolism. What was also interesting to us that many of these proteins were also enriching during neurological disease, for example, Huntington disease, ALS, and even during long-term depression. So of course we were thinking that, well, you know, the patients are having problems in memory, problems with cognitive function. So maybe this is something related to the metabolism of the cell. Let's go further into that to check if this is the case. So next thing we did, we wanted to check the overall uh, metabolism and the overall pattern of metabolites that those cells are producing during, during the infection. So again, what we did, we extracted the cells the same way we plated the astrocytes and infected them in vitro. And this was done in collaboration with Professor Pedro Manuel Vieira from Unicamp uh, as well. And we did an analysis of uh, using the Seahorse platform, we did a respirometry analysis. And what you can see here is that the overall activation of the cell is increased when we compare the infected cultures with the control cultures. So this is the extracellular acidification rate here, and this is the oxygen consumption rate, rate here, confirming the uh, activation. But what we also did, and we particularly thought this was, this was interesting, we did an analysis of a myton, my, mitochondrial uh, fragmentation, for example. And astrocytes that were infected with SARS-CoV-2, they had mitochondria that were more fragmented. Uh, when compared to control. And also uh, these mitochondria, these cells, they were secreting, they are producing more reactive oxygen species than uh, no infected controls. So this to us, you know, corroborates the findings of the proteomics showing that yes, there were, you know, proteins of metabolism were up regulated or they were differently expressed. And here, yes, you know, the metabolic, the overall status, uh, metabolic status of the cell is uh, also changed. And for us, what's clear is that this metabolism is uh, increased or hyperactivated. So next, we wanted to check the overall uh, change in metabolites in those supernatants. So uh, we did a metabolomics and we observed that many of the metabolites were differently, uh, they were different in, in, in concentration when compared to the control. So of course we can say that pyruvate was reduced, lactate was reduced, and lactate is very important. So first thing, lactate is the fuel for, for example, for, uh, for neurons. And here we see that there is a reduction of lactate. So this may also, you know, uh, tells us that, you know, maybe the fuel for neurons are not the best. Uh, at, at, at its best level because it's reduced compared to the control. Uh, and in fact, if you go to the many other metabolites, it's pretty much the same. But I'm gonna focus with you in the, in the glutamine glutamate balance. So, and why is that? Well, 90% of our synapses in the brain are glutamatergic. So glutamate is a very important uh, neurotransmitter in the brain. But the thing is that glutamate is not only used as a neurotransmitter. 
So when glutamate is converted from glutamine in the cytoplasm, this glutamate may either be transported to the presynaptic vessel and then to be used as a neurotransmitter, but also the fact is that glutamine may be converted to glutamate and glutamate then be converted to alpha ketoglutarate. And alpha ketoglutarate may be transported to the mitochondria to fuel the TCA cycle. So it's like, you know, the glutamate has two pathways. The first one is to act like a, 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 a neurotransmitter, or it can choose, you know, to be metabolized, to be converted to alpha ketoglutarate to fuel the TCA cycle. So it, it, it's something like either you're going to be a neurotransmitter or you're going to be an energy source. So, and what's, what seems to us is that due to a reduction in glutamine, although we have not reached significance in glutamate, but there was also a reduction in alpha ketoglutarate, we believe that this has been extensive, extensively consumed as if the cell wanted to generate energy from glutamine and glutamate. So what we believe is that instead going to the presynaptic vessel to become a neurotransmitter, glutamate is being converted to alpha ketoglutarate to generate energy. And of course, this has been shown before for many viruses because viruses, they hijack the metabolism of the cell because they need energy, not themselves, but you know, they need the cell to have energy to, of course, produce uh, its, own, its own proteins, the viral proteins that it's needed. So this uh, glutamine, glutamine thing was particularly interesting to us. So we wanted to check further what's going on, what is the real relevance of glutamine here? So what we did was we used different drugs to block different, uh, different steps of the metabolism of the cell. And we, for example, we block glycolysis and we block uh, fatty acid synthesis oxidation, but we also block uh, the use of glutamine through this drug here, which is called DON. And then uh, what we saw was very interesting. So uh, even though we had not seen difference for uh, during the blockage of glycolysis or fatty acid oxidation, we did see a reduction in viral loads when we uh, tested the cultures in the presence of uh, the glutaminolysis inhibitor. So this is here for uh, viral, gene, uh, viral genome. This is for viral particles released in the supernatal. So this is very clear that if you block the use of glutamine, you had less uh, viral particles released in the supernatal. And what was interesting is that if we add glutamine to the culture, we had a slight increase in the amount of viral, uh, of viral, load, viral load, sorry about that. So it seems that uh, what we thought before was making sense. So the viral is using glutamine as a energy source for the cell to work properly and probably produce uh, viral particles. And again, when we checked for the immune response, we observed that when we had the glutaminolysis blockade, we had a reduced amount of inflammatory cytokines as ION6, ION beta, even interferon alpha, not for interferon beta. Yes, again, for ACE2 and ISG and IFTM3. And the reason for that is because, well, we believe that the response is produced uh, directly so the, the amount of cyto inflammatory cytokines probably correlate with the amount of virus. So as much virus you have, probably, probably more inflammatory cytokines you have. So if we use DON and we reduce viral loads, so that's the reason why we believe the cytokines are also, are also going down. Okay, but then the next question is, wow, this is very beautiful, you know, uh, looks like, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infects astrocytes, replicate in astrocytes, and it changes the overall pattern of expression of proteins, especially those related to metabolism, right? But the thing is that, is it really happening in vivo as well? Because of course, we were working with uh, fully isolated astrocytes, and of course, 
the environment inside the brain is very complex. And we have not only astrocytes, but we have, of course, neurons and we have microglia and we have actually, you know, other cells that may be taking, uh, taking place and, and, you know, uh, uh, supporting this overall inflammatory or overall uh, changes in the protein expression. So to answer that, what we did next was we infected the animals in vivo. So we used Syrian hamsters, animals. They were infected through the nose. And what we did was many days, day four, seven, 10, and so on, after infection, we extracted the brain again. We isolated the brain from the meninges. And of course, we worked with this brain to check and to evaluate many different uh, parameters that we were, we were interested, of course. And the first one was the presence of the virus. And this is a, in accordance, uh, this is a, you know, in accordance with the literature, previous papers have already been shown that you can find uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome in the brain. And here we were able to do so in the olfactory bulb, cortex, hippocampus, and other areas of the brain. So yes, uh, seven days post infection, we could check, we could see that there was a SARS-CoV-2 virus in, those, in the brains of those animals. And of course, if they are really there, we wanted to see if there was a change in uh, cytokines. And again, the answer uh, is yes. So these are, I'm only showing you here day four and day seven. And so, yes, there is more TNF alpha, I won beta and I, I own six, I own six. Of course, some of these cytokines, they remain high, others uh, uh, go back to a normal level. Uh, here, ACE2, there was not an increase when we compare to the control, but for ISG20 and IFTM3, again, there was an increase showing that type 1 interference are being, are being produced. So this is the hippocampus. But the first, another thing that I want to remind you is that, of course, the hippocampus is a very important region of the brain for the establishment of memory, right? So, and that's exactly where we wanted to go. We, we wanted to go, uh, we wanted to check whether there was a correlation, a relationship between uh, hypocompound infection with SARS-CoV-2 and the cognitive uh, impairment or, or memory loss that the patient developed. The same thing here for the cortex. We could see again that there was, there was an increase of inflammatory cytokines. Again, here, TNF-alpha, 6 and 9 beta. And again, uh, well, although we saw an increase in uh, ACE2 at day 4, but not at day 7, and some of these ISGs were upregulated again. So the same with some, of course, uh, differences, but pretty much we could see that the infection in vivo was able to change and increase an inflammatory response in the brain of those of those animals. So of course, uh, the next thing to do was, well, we saw the same cytokines in vitro and in vivo, pretty much the same pattern. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, well, what about the overall protein expression? Do we see the same pattern or do we see differentially expressed proteins in the brain of the animals when we compare to the in vitro model and we did, of course, the same protocol, infected the animals, and then we dissected the different brain areas, mostly cortex and hippocampus, and we submitted it to a proteomic analysis. And what we saw was very interesting again. So we confirmed that there was definitely a, a differential expression of proteins in the brain. So here is uh, so here we see the graph, the Vulcano plot for the hippocampus. We had around 20 upregulated proteins uh, and 68 downregulated proteins in, in the hippocampus. And in the cord is an even more robust change uh, where you can see that there were 87 upregulated proteins and 381 downregulated proteins in this in this region of of the brain. So, all right, we could see that when we infect the animals in vivo first, the, well, it seems that there is some uh, gen viral genome in the brain. 
And most important, there is a very robust differential expression of proteins in those brains. But of course, the question is, well, now, uh, do these proteins belong to the same uh, biological processes as before? And pretty much, yes. So if you check here, this is the pathway analysis uh, enrichment of pathways when we use this uh, proteomic data from the in vivo infected animals. And again, what is interesting is that the pathways they were enriched in these uh, animals were carbon metabolism, if you see here, glycolysis, long-term depression. And this is pretty much uh, convergent, pretty much similar with uh, the graphs or with the analysis that we performed uh, in the in vitro experiment. What we also did was, well, what, what if we compare our data with some data sets or some data that has been published before? So we did that. So we compared our differently expressed proteins here on the left with a public available data set of nine deceased patients that uh, died of severe of complications of COVID-19. So they had samples, brain samples of these patients and this beautiful paper here, they, uh, they did a single cell RNA sequencing of these eight patients. And they, they, they deposited all the data. And of course, we compared our differentially expression proteins to the uh, RNA sequencing uh, data sets of this paper. And what is interesting, of course, we saw many different expressed mm -hmm. proteins, but when we go to the paper, so the paper was a single cell analysis, right? So they have oligodendrocyte precursor cells, oligodendrocytes and so on. But when we go to astrocytes, what they saw in astrocytes was that these astrocytes, they had differentially expression of genes that correlated with glycolysis here, right? And actually many other cells also uh, show differently expression of genes that correlated, for example, with glutamate synapses, like ionotropic glutamate receptor or uh, uh, metabotropic glutamate receptor. So here, there is definitely a correlation between the, the single cell analysis of the paper showing that their astrocyte had an impact on glycolysis. And this is, of course, in agreement with our data, uh, although our data was, in, uh, was, uh, was not single cell RNA sequencing, but was proteomic, proteomic analysis. So what is also interesting is that this same paper here, they observed that when they analyzed the differentially expressed genes, in different cellular populations, many, many of this uh, enrichment happens to be in astrocytes and the pathways correlated with uh, important human diseases as again, ALS that we also observe it, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety and cognitive impact. So this is interesting. This was very interesting to us. So this paper shows that astrocytes are greatly impacted during COVID-19. And in this case, of course, especially in uh, severe cases of COVID-19. But most important is that this impact correlates with pathways of, of, uh, of carbon metabolism, as well as to uh, neurological diseases, as for example, anxiety and uh, diseases with cognitive impact. And of course, our, there, there were many papers published later showing that, you know, uh, long COVID causes these uh, the syndromes of chronic fatigue, memory loss, confusion that may last for a very long, long period. And actually that's why they call it the long COVID. So for us, what we show in our paper here, which is, uh, which is interesting is that, so, we observed that astrocytes from Syrian hamster, primary astrocytes, they are able to be infected with the virus. The virus replicates in those cells and it, 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 it is able to induce a pro-inflammatory response. Along with that, there is an uh, important change in the expression of proteins 
especially proteins that correlate with carbon metabolism. And um, al along with those proteins, we observed that there was an imbalance uh, when we compare glutamine and glutamate. And when we block the use of, of uh, glutamine, when we block glutaminolysis, we had a reduced viral replication in this, uh, in this uh, astrocytes in vitro. So we think that during, in fact, during the infection of SARS-CoV-2, it's like the, the, the virus needs the cell to take energy from glutamine through glutamate alpha catagluterate. And on the other hand, probably this deviation from the synaptic site or the pre the presynaptic vesicle would probably impair uh, the glutamate, uh, the glutamatergic synapses in the brain. And when we go to the in vivo messages, it's pretty much the same. So we saw the SARS-CoV-2 was able to infect the cortexes and the hippocampi of these animals and also triggering a pro-inflammatory response. Uh, we saw that pretty much the same pattern of protein expression uh, was observed in both cases, was, was, I'm sorry about that. So the overall expression of proteins, especially those proteins that correlate with metabolism, they very similar to what we have observed in vitro. And although, of course, I know this is an, a weakness of our paper because we have not had uh, the chance to check glutamine in vivo. We wanted to treat the animals with uh, glutaminosis glutaminolysis blocker for instance to check what it what would happen but unfortunately we were not we were not able to do that but at the same time when we compare our data with data sets from a previously published paper in nature we see that there is some convergence convergence of uh of biological processes mostly uh biological process of energy a metabolism or, or glucose or carbon metabolism that is taking place in, in astrocytes. So pretty much we believe that our, uh, our findings agree or support this idea that during SARS-CoV-2 infection in the brain, there is something called uh, uh, catapleurosis in which uh, glutamine is converted to glutamate and glutamate to alpha catagluterate to fuel the TCA cycle to give energy to the cell. So the virus can, you know, replicate and release and release particles. And when we block the glutamine usage, you know, there is a reduction of, uh, of viral replication in the brain. And what we believe is that due to this consumption of glutamine, this may impact and this may correlate with the memory loss and cognitive function in these patients. So in fact, there was a paper recently published in Nature, in Nature Neuroscience showing that uh, glutamine may also be released in the synaptic uh, cleft in the, in the synapse, in the synapses, and glutamine is, may also favor memory, uh, uh, especially in the hippocampus. So this is something that also goes uh, in accordance with our findings showing that, well, glutamine is important not only to release, to form glutamate to become a neurotransmitter, but also glutamine itself may be released uh, to the synapse and act as, as, a neuro, as a neurotransmitter. So of course, I would like to finish by thanking everybody with whom we've ha we had collaborated. So especially Professor, uh, Professor Daniel Martins Souza from Unicamp and his students, Professor Pedro Vieira from Unicamp as well, Professor Claudia Moura, he was, she was uh, uh, collaborating with us, helping us with the Syrian hamsters. Professor Carolina Moyos from uh, pharmacology department, she helped us uh, with the images and, uh, and the immunofluorescence. Here from the Department of Immunology, I'd like to thank Denise and, and Professor Regina Lima for the collaboration with the animals. Professor Ma Ana Marcia from the microbiology department as well. Professor Tiago Cunha, helped us with the slices, with the brain slices that I had not uh, shown to you here, but it is in the paper. Uh, we use the LNANU CN pain facility for the electron microscopy, which we want to thank you very much, as well as uh, Professor Elia from the Faculdade de Medicina da USP. Of course, I want to thank Professor Karsten and Professor Claudio from, uh, from ICB uh, because uh, 
yeah, they allowed us to use the uh, BSL3 facility. And of course, last but not least, the scientific platform Pasteur USP, uh, where we had uh, performed most of our experiments. I'd like to acknowledge and, and, and dedicate this uh, presentation to Newton Barreto, amazing person, amazing postdoc that was helping us with this, uh, with this project. And unfortunately, he passed away due to COVID-19. Last but not least, also I would like to thank everybody in my lab, especially of course here, Lilian and Ye. So they were the main, uh, the leaders of this project. They performed all, mostly all the experiments in vitro and many of the experiments in vivo as well. So again, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you had enjoyed. And of course I am open. I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Jia. Amazing talk. Thank Super you. interesting. Now we are open for, for questions. Uh, I have a, a question. I, I don't know if I can start. Gustavo, yes. I was uh, interested about the this animal model because I I, I, I saw your results and I see that you can see molecularly the same uh, aspect of COVID. But uh, my question if, uh, is if you know something about the clinical uh, response, some clinical data that you can see in this, in this uh, animal model uh, regarding the neurological aspects. Okay, oh, that's, yeah, that's a great point, Paula. So we we could check the protein expression and do the proteomics right and unfortunately we wanted to we went we wanted to do many other experiments to be honest for example we wanted to do of course at first to block the glutamine the glutaminolysis in vivo to check whether we had a reduced viral uh, replication in the brain we couldn't do that and besides we wanted to do behavioral analysis because of course, if we're working with uh, cognitive uh, problems or anxiety problems, we wanted to check whether the infected hamsters were more anxious or if they had you know, cognitive problems and so on. Very unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So this is because it's a BSL-3 facility and I had many problems to establish that. And at the end, you know, we wanted to publish the paper and, you know, uh, we, yeah, you, ha you have a good point. Uh, you, you can see that I'm a little bit frustrated, right? Because I know this is the, the best point because does, does it happen in vivo in the animals? So at least we were not able to check that. But there are some papers showing interesting things. For example, there is one paper in, in, in human subjects, one young uh, patient who had mild infection, but he seven, uh, 14 days after diagnosis, he started to lose his memory and some cognitive problem. And they did uh, uh, an analysis of glucose and glutamine in the brain by PET scan. And they, they could see, they could show that there was a reduction. And 28 days later, when he felt better and he was not having the memory loss anymore, he had the levels of glutamine in the brain back to normal. So, of course, this is only one case report, but I think it, you know, helps to consolidate this idea that there is something going on concerning immune metabolic and, and, uh, and synaptic uh, thing in those, in those brains. We wanted to. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I think that if you have some, it would be perfect if you could show some, some clinical aspect. Yes. Uh, Definitely. You're totally right. So now we have a question, Luisa. Hi, Joe. First of all, Hello, amazing presentation, amazing Thank data you. You, you guys have. So I have a very basic question regarding the virus physiology because I never have heard before about that 
double membrane uh, vesicles. I mm -hmm. do not understand how it works. And it's like a viral particle or it comes from the host membrane and just means that the cell are infected by the virus and are just uh, having these vesicles inside it. Yeah, exactly, Luisa. So, well, I'm not the expert as well, but what, what we, well, we, find, we found many papers because showing that these double membrane vesicles, they are uh, present when you have coronavirus in general, not only SARS-CoV-2. Even if you have SARS-CoV-1 or the others, you can have that. And this is a double membrane that is released from the ER. So when the virus is replicating and packing, you know, these double membrane vesicles, they start to appear. And if you see in our picture, it's very abundant. They are, they are like everywhere, right? So yeah, this is characteristic of, of, of the coronavirus infection, but not only for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, but other uh, virus families, it could happen also. Luisa, I have to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know. Very interesting. I never have heard before about it. Yeah, me, me neither. So when we had the electron microscopy analysis, we, we were at the screen trying to find the virus is like two or three weeks. And at the beginning, everything we saw, we thought there was virus, but some were vesicles, some were other, you know, organelles. And actually many papers came out showing that, look, this is virus, this is not. And it seems that it's very, very usual that people confound these double membrane vesicles with the virus. But of course, the size is very different. These, these DMVs, they are bigger than the virus. Great. Thank you, Luisa. Let me see here if I have a question in YouTube. Just a moment. We have one in the chat, uh, and uh, Bruno also is raising it. So I have two questions for you. So Bruno, you can. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre, for a very exciting talk, uh, very interesting data. Um, I was wondering if uh, the changes that uh, you notice in uh, carbon metabolism, they are uh, in response to an active uh, virus infection or if there is any uh, change that uh, may outlast uh, the infection, like uh, uh, epigenetic changes in these, in these cells and uh, uh, the central nervous systems of these infected animals. And also, uh, uh, are these uh, changes uh, specific to the SARS-CoV-2 infection or they can uh, be found more generally in uh, virus infection? I know that uh, you, you, you work a lot with the uh, Zika virus, virus and uh, uh, I wonder if you could comment on that as well. Thank you very much. No, perfect, thank you. Th those are very good points. So the first one is, we don't know, we don't know in a sense that, so are, are the changes in the protein expression due to the presence of the virus or the overall inflammatory milieu, right? We don't know, that's a very good point because we know that cytokines themselves, they are able to totally change the, 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 the overall metabolism of the cell, right? So we don't know, we don't know how to answer that, but what is clear to us is that either way, for us, the presence of glutamine is important. So what we believe actually is that, so if you remember the papers from, from Pedro, from Unicampi, he showed that since the very beginning, there is a high glycolytic activity that fuels viral replication, right? One thing that we believe is that, so glucose in the brain is not like kind of the same thing because the neurons, they depend a lot on lactate and glutamine is also very important. So the, my belief is that at the beginning, okay, the glucose is there, the, the virus, the cells are using glucose and then it's somehow, you know, depleted or the level is not the same anymore. And then the cell switches to use glutamine and switches to glutamine, turn it into alpha ketoglutarate to fuel the TCA cycle, right? So going back to your question, even if it's directly the virus or not, we don't know. But uh, we have this question and we are trying to work with the isolated proteins, for example. So 
what if some structural proteins or non-structural proteins themselves induce it? That would be interesting, right? Because then it shows that it's an active uh, uh, way of the virus to promote that switch to glutamine, but, but we don't know. And I'm sorry, what was the second point you brought? The second question? Uh, if it's uh, these uh, alterations were specific for SARS-CoV-2 infection, oh, okay. or if they can be found in other virus infections in the CNS. Yeah, this is a good point as well. So yes, it has been shown to other viruses as well. So, it, well, this is this is funny at the same time because I have to study a lot to understand these viruses, right? And when you go back to papers like if uh, with, for example, influenza and other viruses. It's very usual that the virus, they completely re rewire the metabolism of the cell because, you know, he wants to guarantee the production of his particles. So it changes from this to that, and it may vary from time to time. For example, I didn't mention in my data there, but the only metabolite that was increased was acetate. So maybe, you know, it's a small chain fatty acid. I don't know if maybe it's, he, it's doing that because then you have more membrane and you have more possibility to produce viral envelope, for example. So we don't know, but that's that's a really good point. Oja, just before you move to another question, just a quick add to Bruno's. If in your in vitro system, if you deliver inactivated virus to your astrocytes, does they respond in the same way as the alive, you know, fully activated particles? Or you haven't done that? No, I haven't done that. Right. Haven't so done that. Do you think, okay, so do you think you need, you need the viable virus or just the stimuli of the infection? Although we have not done it, I believe it, it depends on the presence of the virus. Because, so again, I, I do believe the cytokines are doing something. Type 1 interference, they're probably doing something, you know. And, but yeah, we cannot, I cannot affirm, say that, yes, it's this or it's that. I cannot say that. Going further, I think it's the same thing as Professor Julius Sharpstein is asking. So, do you believe that glutamine changed ACE2 expression because of that you have a reduced? Could be, could be. Definitely could be. But we also have to remember that uh, neuropilin 1 is another viral receptor that is expressed in the brain and seems to be very relevant. So, and I don't, well, at least we didn't check whether the glutamine, uh, the blockade is uh, changing the expression of neuropilin 1, for example. So we don't know. It could be, but again, you know, I cannot say that. Great, thank you. And now, Professor Miriam, if you want to ask your question. Hi, Professor Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much for your talk. It was really amazing to see your work. Hello, and thanks. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is following up on what Bruno, Bruno and Gustavo were asking as well. Um, I, I thought uh, on your in vitro uh, assay, I saw that when you add both gl glucose and glutamine, uh, you have normal viral load. You only see an increase when you add uh, glutamine alone. So I was wondering about that. If you do see a down regulation in the, I don't know, uh, the, the glucose uh, channel transporter or exokinase, I, I wasn't able to pinpoint it from your uh, um, whole data. Um, and, uh, and then following on that, uh, I had the impression that the data that you saw, that you showed was mostly four days or seven days post-infection. And I wonder if the hamster, uh, if they clear the virus or if you're able to do long-term uh, infections to uh, look again and see if you see the same pattern. So thank you. Thank you, great points again. So we have not had the chance to check for the glucose transporters, for example, but we did many glutamate transporters and amino excitatory amino acid transporters because we, uh, we wanted to add the glutamine glutamate Change, switch and imbalance to, for example, a reduction of recapture or a reduction of transporter of amino acids. And we didn't see any difference, in fact. So when we checked for many of these SLA, CA1A1, 
are, you know, these co-transporters and antiparters of glutamine and glutamine, we didn't see any difference. I, again, we didn't do that for, for the glucose transporters. Maybe, maybe there is also something going on. But I like to remind you that, you know, for astrocytes, they do use glucose, but if you, if you go back to the neurons, they depend a lot on lactate, for example. So lactate is very important. And we saw here that lactate was reduced. So this is also some, we are thinking a lot about the astrocyte, but in the brain, the astrocyte is supporting the neuron. So if there's a reduction of lactate, probably there is a reduction in fueling the, the neurons as well, right? Probably again. And, and the time points, well, perfect observation. Yeah, we wanted to do more. So, uh, so depending on the, the dose, the amount of virus that you give to the animals, they will very follow the same, you know, the more virus, the more, the sicker they get. And even uh, there was a paper that came out last week. They show that if you infect the, the, the hamster and let it to so resolve the infection and infect them two months later, they, they have a memory response and the disease is not as bad as the first time. So yes, it, it, it will depend on the amount of the virus that you infect. Okay, we wanted to do later time points. We, we really wanted to, but this is something technical and, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, yeah. I, sorry, sorry, Bonnie. Uh, no, I no keep, problem. I keep enter, just, just to pick up uh, the Miriam's question and the answer yes. uh, mm -hmm. of Jean's regarding the concentration. So is there any correlation between these uh, late COVID symptoms with the non-vaccinated or vaccinated people? Is there any protection regarding either, you know, viral concentration, I, I, I suppose, or any other aspect of the immune response? That is a good point, Gustavo. To be honest, I don't know. But the thing is that this long COVID, they, they have been observed in, it, in both vaccinated and non-vaccinated. So, but I don't know if the, the specific no correlation has been done. Yeah. Yeah, there's no statistics. Yeah, yeah that not, be not that I know, not that I know, but maybe if we look further, we can find something. It makes sense. And, uh, and what about other comorbidities? Is there any that uh, predispose to the long COVID, uh... to the neuro, to the neurological aspect. Yeah, yeah. Mm, not that I know. No, it's very interesting. So very healthy patients develop neurological symptoms. You know, it's, it's as I mentioned, is a there was this case of a young a young guy. I think he was twenty four years old. You know, so we don't know. Yeah. I was wondering uh, uh, if you, what is your next uh, plans to, to continue this research? And if you plan to see something regarding the morphological aspects of the, the astrocytes. Oh, awesome. So we wanted to do more of, yeah. We, we wanted to treat the animals in vivo with the glutamine antagonist right with the blocker of glutaminol but we, we couldn't do that but one thing we can do because we can do that in vitro is as i mentioned before i want to i want to we want to check some specific proteins of the virus because these proteins they may bind in many different uh, targets you know some of these nsp they may bind to inflammasomes other may bind to transcription factors and well what if they bind to metabolism proteins that would be very interesting right but yeah we are starting this idea to be honest just that and the, about the morphological aspect do you oh, the morpholo no we have not thought of that actually specifically on the morphology no we're more into the transcriptional profile or the proteins that the neurons express but it's an important point yeah the things that astrocytes are you know Astrocytes are gaining a lot of notoriety lately. You know, there are amazing papers showing the huge heterogeneity of astrocytes in the brain. So there was one paper published in Nature Neuroscience. The paper had around 30 pages 
and they characterize around 12 or 14 different populations of astrocytes during systemic LPS treatment. So it's, it's you know, the astrocytes are very heterogeneous. So probably we, we are considering the hippocampus and the, the cortex, and we are considering that they are, they're going pretty much the same thing, which is probably not true because the abundance here and there is different. Abundance of microglial cells are different and so on and so on. Yes, thank you. I don't know if Bruno wants, wants to, to ask something. Or Your hand is raised, Bruno. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot to lower it because uh, uh, Google Meet uh, automatically lowers it, you know, your hand, I'm sorry. But since uh, I was called upon, I actually have another question. And uh, uh, the, the one thing that uh, um, uh, I um, uh, understand and um, I agree with all your, you know, your points uh, uh, regarding the infection and the uh, 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 parallel inflammatory reaction that is going on, that it's very hard to uh, discern which one is, uh, is more important. But uh, I was uh, wondering if, what happens after you cannot uh, detect virus particles uh, in these animals or, or, or patients, and uh, uh, how the, these uh, metabolic changes they um, uh, are maintained or not in, in these uh, 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 previously infected uh, uh, individuals? And uh, uh, are there any changes in uh, the epigenetic uh, regulation of these um, metabolic targets or, or anything that uh, uh, is going on that may uh, contribute to the long COVID uh, uh, situation? That is a very... Yeah, you, you brought a good point again. So, in fact, there is a huge, if I can say, dispute in the literature. And some people say that there is no viral replication in the brain. And some other groups, they say, yes, there is replication in the brain. And of course, there are many technical things. For example, when you take out uh, necropsies, you can, of course, that tissue be contaminated by blood and the virus is in the blood and so on. On the other hand, the animal models, they pretty much say that, yes, the virus is there and it is replicating. So this is one thing, okay? So this is kind of an open question. And there is also something called abortive replication, which is the virus is replicating the genome, but it's not uh, releasing fully mature particles. So they believe that this may be going on, right? And it, but if it is going on, Still, you have the RNA of the virus inside the cell. So probably, you know, innate immune response is being triggered. Cytokines are being produced. And then you have the change on the, on the, metabolic, on the metabolic profile. So going back to your question, what's going on in this long term? So you don't find virus, but the guy is, in, is having, you know, memory loss or so on. So in my opinion, two possibilities. One is... Maybe the virus is hidden somewhere and we have no idea. So now we know that we, we have so many meningeal resident immune cells. And, this, you know, when we check the, the patient, we are checking for the blood or, you know, the swabs and so on. We are, we are not taking the tissue. So we don't know if the virus is there, hidden somewhere or no. But another point you brought, which is the epigenetic fact. So there are some papers coming out showing that there is some, you know, changes in some promoters. But in our case, what I would like to mention actually, and I forgot, when we have this switch glutamine and glutamate, so we have an increase, for example, of alpha ketoglutarate and many metabolites that serve as substrate for, for example, uh, DNA methyltransferase, right? So when, we, when you have these changes in the metabolism, you may either favor or not the machinery to open and close some genes. So if it's going on in our, in our experiment, probably it is, probably it is. But again, well, we didn't have the chance, the chance to, to do that. So there are papers showing, showing for example, during uh, glioblastoma, uh, when you have cancer in the brain, right? 
So you have a switch from glutamine and glutamate, and then you have changes in histone deacetylase level, for example, and that will open and close some some uh, some promoter regions of the of certain genes. It could be happening, as again, but at least, unfortunately, we didn't have the chance to do that as well. So many, so many possibilities, right? Ojia, uh, one last question. Uh, so, is there, is it possible to manipulate the hamster so you can eliminate the T cells, let's say, or the the adaptive immunity, and then you do your injections, whatever, and see because I, I think this this manipulation of the metabolism it's more complicated because I think it will mess with the whole animal. But just to know whether it's the virus or you need the immune response somehow, the cytokines, the storm, and many of it, I think, is modulated, at least at the, in the brain, according to a lot of papers that we are using in our, our other discourse. So what do you think? It's a good point. Yeah. So one thing we 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 are you know maybe we will do in the future because there's so many difficulties. But we could use the ACE2 transgenic animal. Yeah. And, and cross. cross them with the FNAR knockout, and then you can at least check whether type one interferons are the ones responsible for these changes in the metabolism, right? Uh, but again. This is a, you know. Yeah, but the, the type one could be also produced by the brain cells. So I was more interested in the the lymphocytes. It's just easy. So you just cross with the, uh, you know, CD4 knockouts or you know, yeah, something like that, just to see yeah, the adaptive. Yeah, I it is definitely definitely interesting. Your question, Gu. But, but I have to remind you that we see changes as soon as four days, you know? Yeah, it's so early. But yeah. It's very early, yeah. But maybe later on, of course, but, but nothing, you know, maybe what's happened is that at the beginning we have resident and early inflammatory cells, but then, you know, we have a lot of lymphocytes in the meninges. And- Yeah, but that, that's so the point because then, I mean, it's the, it's the question, was Bruno's question in the beginning. I mean, I believe that the virus cause, you know, so it's impossible for me to think that the virus itself do not cause anything. So uh -huh. that there are viral, direct viral response. But later on, what happened later on? What maintained? So maybe the adaptive immune response as we've been seeing in another setups. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's this paper from Francisco Quintana who showed that, you know, when exactly. the case cells leave the gut and go talk to the other exactly. side of the brain. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Definitely yeah. may be happening and probably it is happening, but well, very hard to check as well. All right. Great. Interesting discussion. I don't know if uh, Professor Julio wants to say something. Yeah, I, I, I am aware <clears throat> how difficult it is to have access to NB3 facilities to make experiments. So it's always very limited information that you can get. But astrocytes, they have a uh, very important influence on the blood barrier function, right? I mean, did you have any chance uh, to investigate uh, the impact uh, of astrocytes of course, in vivo, it's difficult to say it's astrocyte dependent influence on the barrier. But any, anyway, it would be interesting to know if you have a model, if the hamster is a model in which you can clearly see that the blood brain barrier is open during a certain window, time window of the infection process, because I have not seen that information in a published so far. Maybe I have missed it, but you know. No, you have not. That's a very that's a very important point, Professor. 
In fact, the same point was brought by the reviewer of our <laughs> of our paper, and he asks he asks exactly that. So, uh, it 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 definitely possible that you know these changes may also be impacting the blood brain barrier integrity for sure. But I like to remind you that there is a paper. This was a very interesting paper for Nature Neuroscience as well. They show that the spike protein, when it binds to ACE2 in the endothelial cells, they can cross to the brain. So there is, you know, transcytosis of the spike from the from the lumen of the blood vessel to the brain, to the brain. So although they have not showed that for the viral particle, but for the spike protein, yes. So it may be also, it may be, you know. There is definitely a chance that it is impacting the blood brain barrier integrity for sure. And in your astrocyte model, uh, which is you know it's less complicated than the in vivo experiments, but still you have to have access to the facilities all the time. Uh, you mentioned that you don't know anything about neuropilin versus ACE2. At least in the model system that you are working it would be interesting to know whether you have clear cut evidence that ACE2 is the route of entry of SARS-CoV in the hamster astrocyte. Because in the literature, there is some controversy. You know, there is at least one group, I think it's an Indian group, uh, that actually was challenging the idea that even in the lung, that ACE2 was the route of entry. So I think that for, for, from the viewpoint of basic science, just basic science, you know, not speculating so much about the implications, it would be useful to know whether the astrocyte is also a model for ACE2 dependent or maybe neuropilin or maybe both. I mean, it's, there are not so many groups working on hamsters. So I think that if you could clarify that point, it would be useful for all of us. Perfect. Yes, totally agree. I think Professor Thiago Cunha from Ribeirão, I think he has some data with neuropilin one, but I'm not sure if he did that in the hamster or if he did that in, in mice. I have to talk. But 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 I'm 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 referring to astrocyte. Yes, yes, Ex yes. Exclusively from the point of view of astrocyte, just as basic biology of astrocyte. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Media the, is there. Yeah, my, my question was actually uh, very similar to Julius uh, about the blood brain, the blood brain barrier. If you if you do see engagement of other immune cells, or if it's mostly a glia re uh, reaction or response to the virus that could be uh, modulating these changes. And if you do uh, had uh, access to like long term samples to see if you do have a, a long term compromise as well or maybe depending on the, the severity of the symptoms, if you could correlate that to the uh, integrity of the blood brain barrier and eventually other infiltrations. Yeah, very, very important point for sure. Unfortunately, we couldn't do any of that because as you mentioned, there is also the possibility that the overall storm in the periphery is opening, is helping the BBB to be open, right? But yeah, we, we don't know. We don't know. Definitely, we don't know. And that type of a change in the metabolism, I'm sorry if I, that might have been published and I just didn't see. Uh, do you see something similar in other specialized tissues or is it something yes. particular to the brain? Yes, exactly. So there was a paper that came out a few months ago showing two things. One thing is that uh, uh, the pneumocytes, the, the cells in the lungs, they also undergo a rewiring of the metabolism as well. And uh, including, they use, they use glutamine as well. I think it was a nature communication paper. And there was a recent paper that it has been uh, deposited in bioarchives from actually a friend from India. And uh, he showed that something is going on in T cells. There is also a change in the overall uh, metabolism of the T cell. And if you check there, in the I remember the Vulcano plots and definitely glutamate and glutamine is, is there. I need to read it better, but there is something going on as well. 
And thank you. Thank you. Medium. And uh, I see something, um, some alteration in the transcriptional profile in cardiomyocytes. And one of the, the pathways that I see they're regulated is really uh, regarding the meta metabolism too. So since that uh, in the cardiomyocytes, we, we, the first change is regarding the metabolism and something uh, regarding the mitochondrial too. And then we see the alterations in, pro in contracting in, in proteins uh, of contraction of cardiomyocytes. So maybe the metabolism is the first one, and then we see the functional uh, alterations in the cardiomyocytes. Perfect. Awesome. I didn't know that. Well, we have to remember that the membrane of the mitochondria has a lot of receptors to interact with, you know, viral genome. So it's right there. The mitochondria on one side is acting as an immune response sensor. And of course, on the other side, it's acting as a, a energy source. So I imagine that in cardiomyocyte, it must be very important, right? Great. I don't know if we have more questions, but we can finish for today, yes? And then I want just to thank you so much, Professor Jean, was amazing. And the description was super interesting. And I thank you all the, the professors that uh, participated in, in this discussion. Uh, I also want to remember that next week we have Professor Albert Leonel from Albert Leonel de Matos Guedes from the University of uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So next week we we, ha we have this part this this professor with us. So thank you so much too. And yes, is this for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all these students. All right, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Julio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. Bruno.